Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Competition Studio. Today is November 8th, and that means my guest, uh, my first guest is here with us, Ben Lotti. Ben is the head of piano at Tone Bass. And before we hear from him, we're going to hear a video of him talking to legendary pianist and pedagogue Seymour Bernstein in a recent series uh, of videos about Glenn Gould. So let's hear that. Let me guess, you must not have liked Glenn Gould's playing very much. I didn't. I never heard him ever play anything that I thought was beautiful. Hmm. Even the Bach. Look, he was a wild genius, there's mm -hmm. no question about it. But when I hear his Bach, I'm not aware that I'm listening to Bach. I'm listening to Glenn Gould's neurotic interpretation of it. Can I recommend a Gould recording that I think you would like? What is it? He has a live recording of the Bach three-part inventions from Mos oh. Moscow in the 50s. Really? Is it beautiful? It is. His tone is golden. It's beautiful. It's poetic. It's still Gould, but oh. it's, it's flexible and expressive. So Ben, uh, welcome to the competition studio at the Paderewski Competition. We're delighted to have you here with us. Um, we've had this conversation somewhat before, but just to let all the viewers know, I've invited guests from all over the world to talk to us about competitions and the music profession. And so Ben, you're our first guest, and I'd love to talk with you a bit about tone-based piano. Happy uh, to be here. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Uh, so for everyone who doesn't know Ben, uh, he recently spoke with Seymour Bernstein uh, about Glenn Gould, as you just saw in a video, uh, that sparked a tremendous amount of reaction among musicians all over the world. Uh, ben is a concert pianist who has a DMA from Juilliard. And uh, Ben, maybe you could tell us a little bit to get going. Um, how did you get involved with tone bass and what is tone bass? Well, I finished my doctorate at Juilliard in 2015, and like many of my peers, I started freelancing as a performer, gig, pianist, and, and teacher. Mm -hmm. And I just got sick of living in New York, and I decided I should put my doctorate degree to good use. So I moved back home, I entered the Bach competition in Leipzig, I mm -hmm. uh, buffed up my resume and started applying to jobs, and I wasn't so enthusiastic about it, and then tone bass fell in my lap. It was sort of the perfect job for me. I was very hmm. qualified for it. All the things I was doing that was hurting my chances of getting a good tenure track job were actually really helping me uh, get this position at Tone Bay. So very grateful for that. That was 2019. And hmm. um, it's been going on almost four years now. So when you say you started applying for jobs after you finished your doctorate, you mean university teaching jobs? Yeah, and I didn't do it right away, which also hurts your chances. So the whole academic job market, at least in uh, the, the United States, is um, difficult to uh, uh, to succeed in, mm -hmm. uh, putting it that way. So uh, it turns out a job that uh, draws on you know my experience as a concert presenter and a pianist and a critic and a writer and um, an editor, all of these things ended up basically making me right for this job. So I'm, I'm glad this job exists, and I, and I hope more jobs like this uh, start to pop up in the so future. So for me. users who don't know, what is tone base? How would you encapsulate it? I mean, the one sentence definition of tone base is that it's a Netflix for music conservatories. That's only somewhat <laughs> misleading, but that's pretty much <laughs> a convenient way of thinking about it. Um, uh, but like Netflix, it's a subscription platform. And unlike Netflix, we don't make movies uh, about pianists and TV shows about pianists, but we do film high production value uh, lessons, interviews, workshops uh, with some of the greatest pianists in the world. And we're always trying to get uh, more and more pianists on the site. And uh, Jared, you were one of the first to actually teach for the, the platform uh, when we met up three years ago. So that's one feature, uh, probably the main feature of Tone Base, but we're always expanding our initiatives and programs. We have a live channel, community channel. I've been doing more with YouTube, as you've seen. So we're, we're also um, expanding beyond education and, and doing more and more media. 
And we hope to uh, continue expanding to instruments. We just started violin, and we'll be launching cello in the coming months. Yeah, I saw a cello ad recently. Um, and actually, backtracking a little bit about the whole Seymour Bernstein and Glenn Gould thing, where did that come from, and what's its importance for Tom Bass to talk about Glenn Gould? And there was a series of videos you made, or a series of interviews about Glenn Gould with pianists, right? Well, I've long been obsessed with Gould, uh, for better or worse. Mm. <laughs> And clearly some would think better and some would think worse <laughs> if you if you read any of the comment sections on those uh, videos with Seymour. I met Seymour and I filmed with him uh, a month before the pandemic. And those are the videos you can see on our YouTube channel and in full on the Tone Bass platform in which I'm sitting next to Seymour. I'm playing Chopin and Beethoven for him. He's telling me how it should go, you know, <laughs> and we're having a wonderful time. Um, so I've known him since then. We've always been in touch. He's always writing me very critical emails about different things he sees a pianist doing, both on tone bass and, and on the internet. He's, a, he's got a very sharp edge, but he's also a wonderful and funny person. So I just thought, you know, this is the kind of personality that really should be, people should be uh, seeing more and that we should be engaging with more. As I've made more YouTube content, I thought to myself, why haven't I done anything about Gould? I mean, this is... Mm -hmm. There was, there was a solid five years where, I mean, all I did was listen to Gould. I adopted his aesthetics. I mean, it was a wow. real unhealthy obsession. And I'm glad I've moved on from it, but I still, I learned a lot from it. And I'm always interested in those uh, pianists who um, uh, were inspired by Gould, which is many of them, but also, and I've worked with many pianists now, I was amazed at how many pianists uh, have a real distaste, uh, strong distaste. Did that surprise you? Yeah, it, well, I mean, it didn't entirely surprise me because I've had teachers before who would make, you know, snide remarks under their breath about him. And, I, and I've always known that Gould's appeal was actually more in the mainstream. He's one of the few nearly pop culture level music, uh, right. classical music in the 20th century. And he really milked that. And that, that was annoying to many people in the classical world. You know, he was, he was uh, dumping all over the concert tradition and he was going on his own path and, and selling a million records and all that. And it, there was some jealousy there, but also his interpretations were just offensive to people. And, <laughs> and I've known those. But um, so I knew Seymour didn't like Gould because of that clip you saw of us in that YouTube video where I asked him about Gould. So I said, you know, that was one of many pianists I asked about Gould for the YouTube video, but in the comments, everybody was like, we need to hear more from Seymour. You barely let him speak. Mm -hmm. Let's get him back on. And so then we made two follow-up videos where I have him listen to Mozart and Brahms of uh, Gould recordings. And so anyway, this uh, this ended up being, I guess, a big splash. People, people really got heated. Yeah, the there's comments. a lot of buzz around it. There's a lot of comments on both sides of the fence about that. Yeah, Gould continues to be a hot rod and inspire all kinds of controversy, you know, 40 years after his death. So. But what interests me about Tone Base is that it's becoming a platform where we can also see debates that have been long established in the music world uh, with professors and pianists who are really experienced and have, uh, like Seymour, they've been teaching for well over 60 years. So it's almost becoming an archive of the history of our profession. Yeah, that is, uh, I would say, that's becoming more and more its uh, not central purpose, but definitely one of the main purposes. Mm -hmm. It's not really what we thought of when we started, although I had it in the back of my mind from the beginning. Right. The initial, the, the initial purpose was to create high level video content, the kind that you would get in person in conservatories or the kinds of things that concert pianists know, but they're not sharing with their audience because they don't have a platform to do so. Mm -hmm. The idea was to just capture that and create a platform Mo primarily aimed at amateurs. Uh, there's there's a significant amateur pianist population all around the world, mm -hmm. and these were our primary uh, subscribers, at least we thought at first. But then we realized as we started making more and more videos that lots of folks from uh, you know the music world itself, teachers, right. students, uh, professionals, were getting very interested, and in more and more beginners, you know, who didn't have much experience and weren't necessarily interested in classical music, have found their way to tone base and found a home there. So uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. What what we're doing in, in part is educating people, inspiring people, but also maybe almost more importantly, we're preserving and continuing the mm -hmm. legacy traditions of classical piano, which are mostly marginalized and relegated to a very fringe right. you know, niche. And at least, especially in, the, especially in America, 
uh, not so much in in Europe and and you know the U.S. has nothing like the Chopin competition or even the Paderewski competition in terms of national attention. We right. have big competitions, but no one's covering it. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation right now is, you know, is is unique. There's more emphasis on on the arts across the pond, and so right. um, in part, tone base is kind of an American phenomenon, but we have a global a global reach and a global user base. Certainly, so we're, I've we're heard from, people. actually, on my end, I've heard more from professional pianists about tone bass telling me, oh, I saw this video on tone bass. That's so interesting. What is it about? And what is tone bass in general? So just to recap, it's like the Netflix of piano, where people can access so many different uh, styles of teaching and high-level material. But also, as you're saying to us, it's a platform that beginners and amateurs from all over the world are beginning to be interested in. And it's kind of, it's interesting for me that like a competition where you hear so many different types of performances uh, of pieces that are well established in the standard literature. On tone base, we have basically uh, the gamut of different teaching styles and people with extremely strong convictions that what they're teaching is how you should learn piano and how you should teach piano. Um, so in terms of your interactions with the types of artists who are there, can you tell us a bit about the different teachers you've interacted with and what that's been like? Well, I like to say if I got even two tone based artists in the same room, it, it, it wouldn't be pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's, good, it's good that I work with them, you know, uh, just individually because, and you may not be surprised about this, great pianists, successful pianists and conservatory professors have strong opinions about how to play the piano, how to teach piano how to interpret um, the, the tradition. And hmm. that's what I want to it, it, that's what I want to capture and share. And so in that sense, tone base has to be neutral. <laughs> we can't take a stand. Right. Because if we did, I mean, you know, it would it would be, well, first of all, I just I'm I'm somewhat somewhat of an aesthetic relativist when it comes to the tone base platform. I think any any serious musician who's got a, an artistic viewpoint should you know, is worthy of being uh, platformed on our right. channel. We don't we don't exclude you because you believe that technique should you know m flow from the wrist or whatever it might be, or because you're a Taubman uh, aficionado or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think what matters most is that we share all of this, so that more and more people can exactly like basically decide for themselves. You know, what, maybe they're influenced by this artist or another. Maybe. They learn a lot from many different artists and they come up with their own viewpoint. So we're somewhat of a neutral media platform. I have my own opinions and I, I have to sort of check them at the door when I'm yeah. interviewing artists because I need to I need to find out what they're all about and I can't just impose my opinion. On some level, I'm Seymour is such a uh, firecracker. I am able to throw my opinion at him and he's wonderful at you know debating me. And so mm -hmm. we had a real nice sparring uh, session there, but. In general, I think what is, I think, very hopeful about a platform like Tonebase is that it's a way of promoting not just one or two ideas in the music world, but in general, the the di diversity and variety of perspectives on this rich art form. I think it's healthier the more and more perspectives we can get out there. Mm -hmm. And there's no one truth and there's no one royal road to... <laughs> Uh, to getting to the top of the piano mountain. It's not scientific in that sense. So we should have many different voices. Um, and I think that we're achieving that uh, you know, fairly successfully so far, and we hope to continue. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful that basically by having this resource that is a neutral platform, that when people log in and watch something, they can be for 10 or 15 minutes if they want to, immersed in a very specific approach to piano technique, and then click and then suddenly they're in the totally opposite end of the spectrum or a totally different idea, and they can access it all online. And I actually have been wanting to ask you this for some time. When you started Tone Base, the pandemic hadn't happened yet, but then the pandemic did happen, and having online resources was never more important and online opportunities for learning. So how did uh, Tone Base user base uh, expand and broaden uh, when we were all stuck at home using our computer for our music lessons and our computer for recording and all the rest of it? We definitely saw a surge or an increase in interest and new subscribers uh, in the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, that that settled down by the fall, um, which shows that even when the pandemic wasn't over, you know, people were 
at least getting back to other things besides just sitting down in their house all day long. But certainly it helped when people couldn't go to work or they couldn't socialize the way they used to uh, or go out to eat or anything. They were more often at home thinking, oh, what what hobby that I've been wanting to commit to for yeah. a while can I can I do now because I'm bored and I need to use my, you know, I need to use my time in a way that's stimulating and interesting. And and those are the kind of folks that said, okay, well now is the time to to subscribe to tone base. But mm -hmm. I think um, the fact that we, well, we were lucky that we were creating a video product before that. I mean, I was lucky to be in the music world and have a job at all. Right. Uh, and, and I think that the, the live performance landscape has, has been dramatically altered. And I think more and more musicians need to find their way uh, onto the internet. <laughs> I think, right. I hope if Tony can do anything for a lot of my friends who, um, you know, I, I admire who, you know, all their concerts are getting canceled. You know, I, I think maybe they don't want a YouTube channel, but I hope I can make content with them. I hope they can start creating their own uh, content because this is going to be a, a big part of the future, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think it can be a positive thing. And so I, I also want Tonebase to try to expand its influence in terms of helping young performers um, make careers online as right. well as in the real, as it well as in the real world. And so I think the lessons from COVID, we're still learning them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it wasn't like COVID happened and then suddenly Tone Base, you know, took off. But there was definitely more of an interest. But the interest has always been there. And the world was already moving towards more and more online education. Uh, it's just that COVID sped it up by probably a decade. <laughs> <laughs> and so many teachers felt that online lessons were not going to be efficient or effective, but Tonebase has kind of proven that there can be a lot of positive effects from online learning. And we're seeing from the people competing here at the Paderewski that it's not like the level of playing suddenly dropped extremely low. There's some wonderful piano playing we're hearing here from students who did go through the pandemic and had to study virtually in order to continue learning from their teachers. Um, so tone base is really you've answered my question that I was going to ask you tone base has really offered a lot uh, to the world of online music learning um, but if you could isolate one or two things that it's offered that are for you the thing you're the most proud of or the most valuable what would those things be well I'm I mean I'm proud of the fact that we captured you know for example Leon Fleischer uh, in the twilight of his life mm -hmm. uh, teaching and performing and 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 other artists you know who who saw the 20th century uh, so this goes back to the legacy idea that that you mentioned um but i i think actually the most just personally speaking the most exciting thing was after i made a few youtube videos that um a lot of people watched and and found interesting and enjoyed i got some uh, dms and emails from people and i saw some comments too on the on the youtube video which said something like hey i I never even knew about classical music or classical piano. Mm -hmm. And I found this video and now I'm listening to all the, like, as many Rachmaninoff concertos as I can or whatever. And this is just like, for me, that's the best thing um, because I'm somebody who grew up in uh, a community which, you know, was more about sports than, than piano. And I played those sports and I was on, you know, I was, really? I was living a life in high school. So like on the one hand, I'm on the basketball team. On the other hand, I'm competing in piano competitions and I'm trying to hide that fact from this sort of, let's say mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always felt like, God, who would even, who else likes this besides me? You know, and then I went to conservatory and I met a bunch of people, but I always feel like I, I'm always trying to imagine what somebody who's not been initiated into our world thinks about our art form or how right. they might feel about it. Because I think it's it, universally expressive in that anybody could potentially have a, a beautiful experience with uh, classical piano music. Um, and most people just haven't been exposed in the right way, have all kinds of, uh, you know, cliches in their mind about it. And so I hope tone base on some level can show that this is real, it's serious, but it's also fascinating and, and fun and stimulating and interesting. It's not old fashioned. It's something very modern that people do today mm -hmm. and uh, are recreating all the time. And I think in this day and age, we're past the age of genre distinctions of, of, uh, of record shops where you have to go, this person likes rock and roll, this person likes soul, this person likes the blues, this mm -hmm. person likes classical. These distinctions matter less and less uh, 
in the age of YouTube, um, in the in the age of playlists, you know, where people right. are exposed to all kinds of music from all different ages, and it's all modern, it's all contemporary and and real right now. I think tone bass can at least contribute in part to making classical music part of that mainstream experience. And for me, that's the most, I think, the most exciting thing. There's something I want to go back to, and then maybe we can hear one of the competition performances and, and talk a little bit about it. Uh, that when you were on a basketball team and you tried to keep your world separate, uh, because classical music is kind of seen as something, as you said, on the fringe. Uh, but audiences don't necessarily know uh, on a wide scale how exciting music can be when you listen to it live and that's what we feel in competitions it's such a whirlwind performance after performance after performance um, and it really at a competition like this one it gives the audience an opportunity to see how exciting it is to watch live music and how exciting the programs can be i think competitions especially where uh you know pianists are at a really similar level mm -hmm. and often playing the same pieces can be really helpful for new audiences because they can First of all, it's good for them to hear the same piece more than once. So, right. for example, in the Paderewski competition, I imagine different competitors are playing the same Paderewski piece. Of, uh, maybe even um, other pieces are required, or, or at least yeah, there's a required they have a similar piece. repertoire. Mm -hmm. I think that even if they're not comparing between the same pieces, I think anybody with any musical experience or background, and maybe none in classical music, can can sort of walk into that concert hall or turn on that live stream and be interested in these extremely talented young people doing something really beautiful and then comparing them mm -hmm. with each other. And this is, I actually think, a healthy aspect of competition, even though, uh, because I'm a pianist myself, I know the negatives of that right. very thing that I'm describing. But for audiences, it's a chance to say, OK, these people are doing the same thing in, in different ways and, and actually have a discussion about it. Suddenly, they're listening in a new way. And that's ultimately what the goal is people who aren't initiated into classical music or, or piano. Um, it, another way of saying that is they haven't yet learned how to listen to it. Right. Uh, of course, anybody can, but it's not a matter of passively hearing the music like background mm -hmm. wallpaper. It's a matter of even if you notice one thing in it, now your ear is tuned in and you're going to start noticing more subtleties. You're going to start feeling the form. You're going to remember that motive, uh, et cetera, right? And so yeah. um, this is also, I think, what our YouTube videos can do and our platform can do. It can help reveal the beauty and, and intrigue of this music to really anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether they're, whether they're an advanced pianist or somebody who's just starting to get curious about it. And like tone base, uh, a platform like a competition can also be a place where people learn about totally new pieces they've never heard before, or some of the less common pieces. Uh, and that's what I'd like to direct our attention to for one of the performers. Uh, can we put maybe hear uh, from Jordania Salome from Georgia, uh, the end of her Scriabin performance, uh, the opus number is 36. Most pianists, when they turn to Scriabin, are doing preludes, etudes, and sonatas. But this is the poem Satanique, uh, which is one of the lesser performed uh, Scriabin pieces. And we're going to hear the end of this. Uh, and this performance was so exciting for me because she really invested in what she was playing, and she really, toward the end, was able to give a forte without brutality and a fortissimo without brutality, but it was uh, very fierce. So maybe we can hear this performance now. to see the expressions on the faces of the competitors. She looked like she was genuinely enjoying playing in this situation, which we all know to be terribly unpleasant and stressful, really. Uh, have you heard that piece before? I, I do know it. Um, I'm getting a little bit of static from interference, by the way. Uh, You're getting I, some it, static? A little bit. Um, OK, 
Okay, now it's better. Okay, great. Okay, thank so, you. Yes, I do know that piece. Um, it, uh, if I remember correct, uh, Garrick Olson recorded it, and I've worked with him a lot, and he loves Scriabin, and I think mm -hmm. this is the one performance I've heard of it. But um, it, it, this is this is Scriabin at his most uh, intentionally insincere. I think he even talked about the insincerity and hypo the hypocrisy of this of this kind of music. Um, there's love and passion, but then there's mocking, almost uh, Mephistopheles like mm -hmm. cynicism. Uh, and you really hear lists Mephisto Waltz and parts of it. I hear the Opus 32 poems here and, and the third, fourth, and fifth sonatas. You For know, sure. it's in that writing. Her performance, just listening to that little snippet, it makes me want to hear more. Um, it, she's enjoying it. I wonder on some level if I'd like to watch her more closely. Can I see the, the irony in her face? Can I hear that in her performance? I need to listen to the whole thing, but what mm -hmm. I just heard was sounded really brilliant and fiery. Yeah, and it's an exciting finisher. She played it, uh, it's an ironic piece to put, she played it after Beethoven Opus 31, number one, uh, which is such an innocent piece. Well, it's innocent, but also maybe, maybe a little ironic itself. I mean, it's hard to take myself seriously in that long, expansive, slow movement of that, of that Beethoven sonata. With <laughs> It's almost, a, for me, almost a parody of a kind of gallant, you know, yeah. um, melody. But no, you're right. I mean, like putting those this otherwise innocent G major piece next to this, uh, you know, satanic poem, I think is is pretty great. I mean, I already love the programming, but maybe there's a little more of a connection there than we might think, although they seem like such in terms of the stuff. irony piece. Yes. Yeah. And that's sort of like self-conscious mm -hmm. uh, ironizing. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to talk about this because I also sit down after the uh, performances and have to review them. And I think about the connections that performers make uh, when they're creating programs for competitions. And something that makes the Paderewski an interesting competition is that performers are told uh, to think about themes that connect their repertoire. Uh, so maybe to round off our discussion, I'd like to ask you about your experience of competing. And when you were pre preparing to uh, go to international competitions, uh, were they monographic competitions? You said you went to the Bach. Or could you plan different programs and try to connect them with a theme or a common idea? I wasn't a huge competitor. I spent, once I got to Juilliard, I actually started being very interested in in things other than the piano. And so I wasn't able to keep uh, my practice regimen as serious and competition focused as some of my peers. Hmm. I have entered them. Um, but one of the things about the Bach competition is I hadn't been to a competition in maybe 10 years, like a serious one. I entered the Juilliard concerto competition, um, mm -hmm. you know, had experiences with that. But I hadn't done a true international competition since college. Uh, and I wanted to feel like a pianist again. So the Bach was one of the, did you call it a monochromatic competition? <laughs> Except that it wasn't because uh, Bob Levin designs this competition in a way that you're actually playing a lot of contrapuntal music from other eras. Right. So, or, or, even, or even other pieces from the Baroque. So I had to learn two Scarlatti sonatas. Uh, actually, a, a Beethoven piece with a fugue in it, so I learned Opus 110. Um, there, others could learn Mozart's uh, Last Sonata, um, and so there were there were many. Uh, I think Ravel was an option. <laughs> really, the Ravel. from Tombeau, the the fugue. Tombeau du Coubertin. You could play. Yeah, you could play this. So, mm -hmm. uh, some years it's Shostakovich prelude fugues. So even that competition, uh, people weren't all playing the same pieces. We weren't all playing Bach, mm -hmm. um, but that was the most intensely I ever. Uh, prepared for a competition and its benefits. I mean, I, I didn't advance. I, I made friends with Rachel Kudo, who ended up winning, and she's actually appears in some um, in some tone based content. Mm -hmm. And I just had a wonderful experience in Leipzig. Um, I'm almost glad that I didn't go on because then I was able to explore Germany a little bit. I visited right. Prague. That's the other thing. You go to a competition, you get kicked out. Hey, at least you're hopefully in a beautiful place. Exactly. You know, you and you get to look around for a few days. I like the social aspect of it, but in terms of my musicianship, what it did, and I still feel the benefits of this, is the way that I learned, for example, the B flat minor fugue, book two. It, one of the, I think it's maybe the hardest fugue of the Walter Clavier. I did it mm -hmm. because I, of course, I heard Gould play it wicked fast, and I was like, "What is this crazy piece? I have to learn it." It's, it was so difficult. Um, it just, it, it's so intricate. And it's so brilliantly constructed and long. And God, he goes into like A flat minor for a while. It's yeah. just very hard to memorize. And I worked it out so systematically, solfeging 
a line while playing the others in every combination and doing so much just work away from the keyboard, copying out the score. Right. I learned it so well. And since then, everything seems easy. <laughs> you know, so so I, I feel like that's something a competition can do is it gave me the pressure to want to really work as hard as I could to learn something as well as I could. And mm -hmm. I think that's what most pianists would say. It makes you work hard. It makes you learn more repertoire. And if you can have a healthy attitude about it and go in and realize it's not about winning, that if you're dedicated enough to music, you will find a career in it. You don't have to win this one. You have to love the process. Mm -hmm. I think most pianists have something like that attitude. Some, I think, are a little too defeated if they don't have success at a competition. But right. what we all gain from it is um, we get to expand our musicianship, I think, in, in many different ways. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. And that is the right attitude to take at a competition because you just never know how it's going to go on stage and how others are playing. And I think in general, now that we have resources like YouTube and Tone Base and so on, we know that there are so many different ways to play things and so many different types of pianists who win competitions and who get second or third or even no prize, but we love their playing. And fortunately, thanks to Tone Bass, we have so many different types of artists now that are available on this incredible resource. So we're very thankful to you uh, for producing all of this and having the vision that you have. Um, I can say uh, on behalf of the Paderewski competition uh, here in the studio, thank you, Ben Lotti, for joining us. It's been great to talk to you. It's a privilege to be a, a part of this uh, competition in a small way. And thank you so much for having me and for um, you know, promoting Tone Bass a little bit and, and letting everybody know what we're about. We're happy to also be uh, sharing this on our channel and, and promoting the Paderewski competition and everything you guys are doing as well. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ben. Okay, that wraps up for today at the competition studio. Thanks again so much to Ben Lottie, head of piano from Tone Bass. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow in the studio again, same time, same place, uh, with Dominic Cayley, who also works with Tone Bass as the head of live programs in its piano department. So we'll be talking about how Tone Bass Piano extends its reach uh, to amateurs and to beginners and to users from all over the world. So Dominic Cayley will be with us tomorrow here in the competition studio. We'll see you then.
Są takie chwile w życiu, które zostają w pamięci. Gdy dźwięki otaczają nas z każdej strony, muzyka przytula. Najważniejsze, by ten czas spędzać z kimś, kogo kochamy, lubimy, szanujemy, w miejscu, które jest dla nas czymś ważnym, do którego zawsze chcemy wracać. Harmonia Pomorska. Daj się przytulić muzyce. Możesz budować formy na siłowni i grać niesamowite solówki. Możesz oddać się pasji gotowania i miksować ścieżki. Możesz pielęgnować swoje rośliny i trygować chórem. Możesz uwieczniać piękne momenty i występować na wielkich scenach. W Akademii Muzycznej w Bydgoszczy stawiamy na Twoją swobodę i rozwój. Dlatego dołącz do nas i poczuj, że naprawdę możesz.
Bydgoszcz, the capital and the largest city of the Kujawian Pomeranian region. It is a city of two rivers, the Vistula, the Bruda and the historic Bydgoszcz Canal. Picturesquely located between forests, it was associated with water from the very beginning. Water is one of the city's elements, and the old granaries standing by the Bruda River tell about its past and the identity of its inhabitants. A remarkable object on the map of Bydgoszcz is the 18th century Bydgoszcz Canal. It contributed to a rapid development of trade and industry, and it associated its residents with the traditions of the skippers and inland navigation forever. The canal, along with the Vistula and Bruda River, is a part of the international E-17 waterway connecting Western Europe with the historic Krulewiec. The revitalized Roder's Mills on the Mill Island have become a place of cultural gatherings and concerts. The Mill Island itself is a vibrant heart of the city that offers world-class entertainment, not only in Opera Nova, but also in a picturesque natural setting on the stage built on the Bruda Embankment. The city can be explored by boats or by a solar boat. From the water level, we can see even more clearly how the past connects with the present and modernity. The living museum created on the renovated Lemara barge tells about the traditions of skippers. From the marina of Bydgoszcz, we can set out in a canoe on a river journey around the city. The monuments of hydraulic engineering can be visited from the picturesque bicycle paths. And in the evening, you can rest in one of the multiple restaurants located by the Młynówka River. Come. See. Feel it. Dzień za dniem, noc za nocą. Nasze życie upływa pod bezkresnym niebem. Marzymy o rzeczach wielkich, ale życzymy sobie rzeczy prostych. Myślami wybiegamy do przodu. Ale jesteśmy świadomi, że życie toczy się tu i teraz. Spoglądamy w niebo z dobrego miejsca na ziemi. Grand Piano.